Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to Everything Cooperative. I'm Vernon Oaks. You know, we talk about the benefits of co-ops for a family, a community, um, our nation, and the world. Co-ops builds better worlds is the motto. Now, we're going to talk about family businesses today with Mr. Gary Pittsford. Good morning, Gary. Good morning, Vernon. Good morning. How are you today? I am great. Yeah. It's a nice sunny day out here in the Midwest. So I know you're out of Indianapolis, but you're on travel this week, I understand. You're <clears throat> I I was I was in your city Tuesday and then uh, Wednesday, Thursday I was all over Illinois. Yeah, so I'm usually someplace uh traveling almost every week. Yeah. So you help family businesses create wealth or keep wealth? What do you do? Well, <laughs> Basically, for the last 45 years, uh, our firm, Castle Wealth Advisors, has tried to help business owners with uh, protecting their company's finances, helping them decide what's the company worth, helping them decide how to sell it, helping them prepare for retirement. You know, can they afford to retire? Should they retire? Who do I sell my company to? There are many millions of baby boomers that between the ages of 60 and 80 uh, that have businesses all over the United States. And they're all concerned about what to do, what to do next, what's the next chapter look like. Uh, So we help them with all of those financial decisions. Uh, Sometimes they will want to sell to uh, somebody in their industry. Sometimes they may want to sell to their children. The children want to take over the family business. And sometimes they'll sell to uh, their key employees or to all of their employees in general through a couple of different methods to sell to the employees or to sell to their children. So there's all kinds of financial decisions that business owners need help with, and we kind of specialize in that in all 50 states throughout the country. How did you get into this business? It sounds fascinating. Oh, I started out as a stockbroker about uh, 50 years ago, but uh, – I didn't like selling things. I decided I wanted to really help people, and I was just going to charge fees like lawyers and accountants. And that was back in the early 70s. And in 73, I started my own firm, and and uh, some of my very first clients were business owners. And then uh, after three or four years, uh, some of the co-op associations asked me to help their members because they were concerned about their members making good financial decisions for their future. Because a lot of the members in the uh, purchasing cooperatives – you know, there's lots of them throughout the United States, and they have thousands of members, and they're concerned about after 30 or 40 years of running your privately held family business, what do you do next, and how do you do it? Because most business owners know how to run their company, but they don't understand the difference between an S-corp or a C-corp. Or they don't know what should be in a buy-sell agreement or a stock redemption agreement, or they don't know what changes they should have in their trust documents, or They don't know what kind of tax they're going to have to pay if they sell their company. So uh, a lot of the uh, purchasing co-ops asked me to help their members. And in the last 40 years, it's grown and grown to, uh, I think we help uh, some of the largest or most of the largest purchasing cooperatives in the country. And it's fun to work with all of them. So there's quickly four different types of co-ops, major types. One is purchasing co-ops, and that's if... uh, People come together to buy products together. They buy in volume. Uh, they they have somebody working for them to do this purchasing, so they get uh, skill sets. And they normally would get it at a cheaper price than if they were buying it on their own. So that's why people come together to form purchasing co-ops. And farmers are perhaps the first ones, and I understand you grew up on a farm. 
And so farmers really use purchasing co-ops a lot. And then on the other side of it is marketing co-ops that farmers and artists are using. Is they come together to sell their products. And so they create companies. And, again, the same thing happens that people that, that work in these marketing firms get to know the markets and get have more markets that they can send their products to. And then the other two types are a consumer cooperative or a employee a cooperative, a worker cooperative. So a mm-hmm. consumer cooperative is when the people that owns and controls the company, uh, they buy and use the, and use the products, and that's uh, credit unions and housing co-ops. And so you get different types of consumer. There's a consumer co-op, Gary, in, in Madison, Wisconsin, that's a clinic. It's a health clinic, and the patients own it. So the patients is a patient, patient-centric uh, health clinic, uh, which I find interesting. So all their policies are based on what the patients want. And then uh, you get a worker cooperative. And that could be any business you can think of. If the if the employees own that business, then it's called a worker cooperative. So those are the types. So you've worked a lot with purchasing co-ops. So what, who, can you give us some examples? What names of purchasing co-ops you've worked with? Well, I hate to throw out a lot of names, but I think some of them probably wouldn't mind. Um, some of the large purchasing co-ops would be like Ace Hardware corporation have hardware stores throughout the country um uh, cca global partners is a company that's got uh, carpet stores carpet one stores flooring america stores and a lot of other uh, purchasing cooperatives under the cca global umbrella uh you know there's smaller groups like uh, blue hawk or uh, sphere one uh, that have hundreds of members so there's all kinds of purchasing co-ops uh that uh band together, and it's like you said a minute ago, by having a group of uh, 500 or 1,000 or 5,000, they can get better purchasing. They can get better quality. They can control their purchasing and their inventory, and it allows them to run their company more efficiently and more profitably. It's it's uh, it's a lot easier to, to uh, be part of 5,000 people in the same business rather than to try and do it all by yourself. And what I've been told is that when some of the other benefits happen is these people come together and they learn best practices from each other. They share data on how best to run the business. So not only do they end up getting better products, but they also figure out and work how to become more efficient and use people like you. To help That's them. true. Uh, at, uh, a lot of the purchasing co-ops have conventions every six months so that the members can come and purchase inventory for the next six months, you know, so in the summertime, they're buying inventory for Christmas, you know, and in that Christmas, they're buying inventory for spring. So every six months, they all come together. And at those conventions, they put out all kinds of best practice ideas. The the co-ops are constantly helping the members with better advertising, better displays, better signage, you know, employee training, you know, a better paint department, you know, a better plumbing department. And they also want us to show up at those conventions and teach them on what is my business worth. Uh, I want to sell it to my children, but I don't know how to do it. Or I want to sell it to my employees. How do I do it? Uh, So we're constantly at those conventions helping all those members with their financial questions to help them with the next chapter of what they want to do. So it's, it's fun to meet so many different family businesses from all over the country you know, and everybody's a little different, but they all have the same basic questions. They're concerned about their employees. They're concerned about their company. They're concerned about their community. They want to, you know, they've spent 30 or 40 years growing this business and being part of the community, and, and they want to keep it going. And there's many different ways that they can do that. We just have to sit down with them and figure out what is best for them in their situation. You know, uh, I normally wait to this question to the end, but I'm going to ask you now. It's right here, and that is, uh, do you like what you do? Oh, I enjoy what I do a lot. I I enjoy complicated financial puzzles. (laughs) I enjoy uh, meeting people. I enjoy hearing about their situations. I enjoy trying to figure out what's best for them because every family is different. You know, some people have three children, and only one wants the business. Some people have four children, and they all work in the business. You know, so how does mom and dad transfer to one child but treat the other two fair? Or how does mom and dad transfer the ownership to four children and still be fair and figure out when mom and dad are gone, who's going to run the business? 
and can mom and dad afford to retire? You know, if you've had a salary and a bonus and all kinds of company benefits for the last 30 or 40 years, and you give up control of the company and you sell your stock to somebody else, your salary is gone, so you want to make sure that you're going to be okay for the next oh, 20, 30, 40 years. A lot of people that retire at 65, the insurance companies will tell you that uh, there's a 15 to 20 percent chance that they'll live to 90 or 95. You know, so you may spend 30 years working and you may spend another 30 years retired. So you've got to be prepared for that. And it's kind of a scary time for business owners and they want to they need help on trying to take that next step. Well, I'm right there. I'm 70 years old. So I'm right between your 60 and 80. So I'm a baby boomer. I have a business. I really don't want to stop working, though. So that's what I and I really like this radio and, t- and getting people out there and getting knowledge about co-op. So I'm sort of wanting to spend more time in this part of the of of what I do and less time in the property management side. But I so I might be reaching out to you guys. <laughs> well, we'll be glad to give you ideas. But I think what you're doing on your radio show is great because members belong to co-ops and co-op executives, they're all looking for and hungry to get educational ideas, education for the members, help them with all kinds of ideas on what's best for them and their family for keeping the business going, keeping the co-op going. You know, Co-ops, they don't want to lose their members. They don't want to lose their purchasing power. You know, And the members, they want to do what's best for their company. So everybody needs that certain amount of education in all the different areas, you know, so if they're selling to children, you go down one path. If they're selling to employees, you go down another path. If they're selling to somebody else in their industry, you go down another path. And there's a couple of other smaller ideas, you know, like you mentioned earlier that uh, worker co-ops are a great idea. Worker co-ops I hear a lot about and ESOPs I hear a lot about, you know, and and when we run into somebody that's got that perfect situation where they want to sell to their employees, and there's one or two employees that can kind of lead the group, it's a perfect situation. Uh, And when I run across those things, uh, we've worked for the last couple years with a a lady that has a company called Project Equity out in uh, San Francisco or Oakland. Her name is uh, Allison Langane, and she's an expert at helping set up worker co-ops throughout the country. And I've worked with her uh, for a couple of years with uh, Blue Hawk, which is a, a heating and air conditioning wholesaler purchasing cooperative, and uh, she's helped so many, many people set up uh, ownership where the employees can participate in the ownership and can increase their net worth and grow their retirement security by coming to work every day, keeping the company profitable, and and being a part owner of what they're doing. Uh, So it's a great opportunity for employees if the whole thing is set up right. uh, Worker co-ops are a growing idea. And it's and it's really perfect if you have the right set of employees with the right kind of leadership. So that's what I've found also. You, you still need the right leadership once whoever started the business leaves the business. You've got to have that leadership still there in some form or fashion. Yeah. When the president, after he's the president, you know, if I refer to a football game, if the president has been the quarterback for the last 30 or 40 years, we got to find another quarterback that can take over the team because uh, the the team may be a great team, but it's not going to win any games if we don't have a great quarterback, which would be the, the new president of the company coming in to take over. So if we've got that, then we have a great situation. If we don't, a lot of times I'll talk with owners about over the next two or three years, try and find a great manager that's working for somebody else in the industry Try and hire them, bring them in, spend two or three years teaching them everything that you know about the business, letting them get to know the employees, the customers, the community, get them involved. And then after they've learned everything for two or three years, then they can take over. But if you don't have somebody in there right now, over the next year or two, try and find somebody, you know, and and it may be a perfect situation. And I've mentioned that to a lot of people. Okay, we're going to take our first break here in a couple of seconds. Gary, it's great what you do, and I like because you've mentioned several times what's best for the employees, what's best for the uh, um, customers, what's best for the community. 
So it's a bigger than what's best for the president or the husband and wife that's leaving the business. So you've got to look at what's best for everybody. And that's why I knew the answer to your question, to the question of do you like your business, because you get to help a lot of people. Yeah. We do. Uh, and, all of my all of my young partners and I, we enjoy meeting lots of people, hundreds of people every year. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOF, at 95.9 FM. Information is power, and that's why we're here to get today, and that's why Mr. Gary Pitchford is giving us information. And we're going to – oh, by, by the way, you know, you've got to use the information in order to get the power. Just having the data, having the information is no power in it. It's like stored power. It's the potential for power, but it's not until you use it. Mr. Gary Pittsford, let's go all the way back to where did you grow up? I understand you grew up on a farm. Yeah, our farms are uh, in central Indiana, uh, south of Anderson, Indiana, west of uh, Newcastle, Indiana. We're out in Henry County, Indiana. We grow a lot of corn, soybeans, and cattle, like any good Indiana farm. <laughs> okay. And and were, were, were you all members of co-ops back then? Well, back then we were because uh, if you go back, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, uh, farmers all took their grain, corn and soybeans and wheat. They took it to the local elevator, and the local elevator were all co-ops. And we would sell the grain, and we were all members of the of the local co-op. Uh, a lot of them in Indiana were called the Farm Bureau Co-op. That's a common name in Indiana. And uh, every farmer owned two or three shares of stock in the local elevator where they sold all their grain at the end of the season. Yeah, so every farmer were parts of uh, part of a co-op, and that's where they uh, not only sold grain, but they also bought a lot of fertilizer in the springtime, or they bought seed corn in the springtime. So, yeah, visiting the local elevator was always fun. When I was a little kid, I'll tell you, I, I enjoyed going to the co-op because on the desk at the co-op, the guy behind the desk, the manager, had a little bowl, and he had uh, Tootsie Rolls uh, in that. And I, every time I, my dad took me to the elevator, I got a Tootsie Roll. So I enjoyed going to the elevator. Okay. Got that candy, boy. Okay. That's right. <laughs> so you said that's what it was. Is it still like that today? Do they still have the Farm Bureaus? Uh, they have some. The Farm Bureaus are, are big enough that they've survived. But a lot of the smaller independent elevators that were owned by one or two people, a lot of them have been bought up by big co uh, big co-ops, big elevator operations, or big companies like Cargill. They've bought up a lot of the elevators, and um, uh, so there's not as many as there used to be. Okay, so you you don't end up working with a lot of them to help them figure out what to do with their business. I haven't. I've worked with a couple of elevator owners, but they usually wound up uh, selling to uh, a large. Uh, you know, grain company like Cargill or a few others. Now, out west in Nebraska and Wisconsin and, and Iowa, there are uh, several large co-ops that have uh, thousands of members. So just imagine uh, a company buying up uh, 100 small elevators. So instead of having 100 small purchasing power, now you got one company that's got the purchasing power of all of those 100 or 200 or 300 elevators that they've bought up uh, out in those states. So some of the co-ops out there are huge. They'll have uh, anywhere from two to 5,000 members. So in the ag industry, everything's gotten bigger. You know, when I was a kid, having 500 acres was a big farm. You know, now today, uh, 5,000 acres is kind of an average farm. You know, so everything's gotten bigger. You know, we used to have a four row planter, you know, now it's 12 rows or 24 rows. You know, so consolidation in the ag industry is, is the same as many other industries. Well, you just said a lot of things that I know very little about. We had maybe somewhere between a half an acre and an acre that my father and my two brothers and I would, I would, um, uh, well, the neighbor had a horse with a plow and he would plow it up and then we would make yep. the rows and then we would go around and plant it. I, I didn't mind any of that. 
I did not like weeding the weeding the stuff. But the part I really liked was harvesting. I loved the harvesting. No, no, I loved the eating what we harvested. Yeah. <laughs> That's what. And then we canned. My mother did the canning and stuff. Well, so, that's something that a lot of farmers don't do anymore. They don't do any canning. Some farmers do, but not as many as they used to. It, if you go back 50 years, every farmer had a big garden, and every farmer did lots of canning. Uh, but very few do that anymore. Uh, being in a farm operation is b- big business nowadays, and it's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job. So there's no time left for uh, weeding the garden or picking the tomatoes or doing any canning. So some do, but not very many. There's a group called the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which is in uh, 13 southern states, and they're mainly African-American. They're mainly smaller farms, 500 acres with probably uh, probably 100 to 500 acres would be it. So, um, yeah, they they band together, and I think in August they have their annual meeting, which I've been to two of them, and I'll go back down to their, their issues that they have. And I don't know what they do for uh, estate planning. But I do know that they've lost a lot of land. They, I've heard numbers of how many thousands or millions of acres that black farmers had. And um, they're down to, let's say there were 50 million uh, during the Civil War or something, and now it's down, or after the Civil War, and now in the 20s, and now it's down to like 3 million acres that black farmers have because of consolidation and because of people losing them because a lot of the family members move to the move north yes northwest yeah. to, for jobs it, the uh, economy is changing the economy is changing there used to be 10 or 15 million farmers throughout the united states many many years ago i think now we're down to less than 3 million farmers uh you know but but it's interesting that those 3 million farmers probably produce just as much produce just as much product just as much gross domestic product for our country as 10 million did 50 years ago. So uh, bigger, uh, more efficient, uh, more profitable uh, is where the ag industry has gone. And and that's true with, you know, any of the purchasing cooperatives that you were talking about. That's why, um, you know, 5,000 members or 4,000 members or 3,000 members gives that group bigger buying power, better buying power, you know, sharing of ideas. It's nice to share ideas with a thousand people rather than just two or three. You know, so uh, everything that you're putting out uh, about all the uh, co-ops that you work with is great information. And that's, again, that's where the information is power, not where it comes. Well, it's interesting that you talk about, uh, you may have it, but you got to use it. Yep. And, and that's another thing that many of the uh, officers of the co-ops that we work with across the country uh, have asked me the last couple of years, especially because this baby boomer thing is becoming a big deal. Uh, every year they're all getting older. And, uh, and a lot of the co-op officers are trying to figure out, you know, I can, they can give information and I, I can teach a class to a hundred people, but those hundred people have to go home and do something, you know, just listening and taking notes and then going home wherever they live, whether it be Texas or New Mexico or Wisconsin, when they go home, they've got to implement these ideas. And a lot of them don't do it because when they go home, they go back to the old routine of opening the store and unloading the inventory off the truck and talking to customers. You know, So having the information is one thing, but they've got to go home and do something. They've got to implement it. And uh, many co-ops and the officers of co-ops are concerned about that. How can I motivate these people to actually develop a plan to sell it to the next generation or to sell it to my key employees, you know, or sell it to somebody else? How can I help this owner actually take the next step, actually go home and do something? So they're, they're all trying to figure that out. So having, you know, knowing the, knowing the information is one thing, but then implementing it, developing a blueprint, developing a plan is step two. And they're trying to figure out how to make them get that put together. Every, everybody that I've had on this show, uh, when I ask the question, do you enjoy your life? I get absolutely resounding. I have to force myself to go home sometimes. They really enjoy their work. And that isn't the case for most Americans. 
And I've had Howard Broski on. You talked about CCA Global. I had Gina Schaefer, uh, she owns, she and her husband own seven Ace Hardware mm-hmm. stores in this area. Mm-hmm. And I told her she looks like a cheerleader. She doesn't look like a business owner. You know, when you say what does one look like and this, she's on her commercials and stuff. And they do a, a really great job with their employees and everything that they do. And I was trying to remember a person that was on talking about Blue, Blue Hawk. So we've had several people on the program who have talked about the companies that you have mentioned. Uh, the, the president of Blue Hawk right now, uh, he's been a president for, I don't know, a few years. His name is Lance Rantala. And I believe he's probably, I think he's on the board of the uh, National Business Cooperative Association, the NCBA. Uh, but uh, Lance has been very vocal and very visible the last few years, and he's doing a real good job of helping the industry. Well, it, it's also interesting for in property management, I deal with people that work on uh, heating, HVAC, ventilation, air conditioning. And um, if those small independent people that, that I'd normally use, if they had a, a group where they could buy and buy it cheaper and, and have stuff right away, that would help them also. So it's interesting. I had not, not even thought about a purchasing co-op for HVAC stuff. Yes. Um, you'll have to... Uh uh, I'll, I'll get you the information on how to get a hold of Lance. Lance lives in Chicago, I- I- Illinois, so uh, I can get you Lance's information. Okay. Um, and we're going we're gonna to have to take our second break, and, and okay. we'll, be, we'll be back to talk about. I want to get into some of the – what are the steps that you go through um, yeah. to get people to where they can uh, retire yeah. or sell okay. their property? We'll be right back. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOM, 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative, and we have Mr. Gary Pittsford, who's out in Indianapolis. Where that, I, that was my stomping ground for about 10 years, Gary. I've worked for Cummings Engine Company and lived in Columbus, Indiana, and I, I end up liking the Midwest. I'm surprised at how cold it can get out there, though. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We we definitely have four seasons. You're right. We do. So so let's go to somebody comes to you and they say, look, Vernon Oaks, I'm 70 years old and I'm looking at, I really want to sell my company to my employees. What what do you what do you tell somebody like me that comes to you? What do you what is what do we do? What's the step? Well, it, it it's kind of like going to the doctor for an examination. Uh, we have to figure out, tell me more about you and what you need and what you want. Tell me more about the employees. Tell me more about your company. I need to understand the whole situation a little bit. You know, do your employees work, do, do your children or does a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law work there? A lot, of, a lot of business owners have a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law working in the company, but they're probably not the right person to, to be the president, to take over. There may be one or two other people that are better qualified. You know, so I need to understand uh, the family, what you need. Tell me more about the people, especially the key senior people, and then let's figure out how, you, how we're going to make this work. One of the first steps that we have to go through is to get a valuation of the company. Uh, that's why, I don't know, uh, 18, 20 years ago I set up a company to do valuations because in the industries where we specialize, we know everything about those industries, and our people here – Uh, do an excellent job of analyzing a company, whether it be in the heating and air conditioning industry or whether it be in the retail hardware industry or whether it be in the floor covering industry. We know those industries and our people can do valuations. So we've got to figure out what the company's worth. Okay. I just want to get this question in while you're doing it. So what do you charge me for that evaluation? It depends on how many hours, but to go through typically a three-year valuation, we have to look at three years' tax returns. We have to look at three years of all of your profit and loss statements. We have to look at three years of all of your balance sheets. And by the time we get through all that, it's about 20 to 25 hours, you know, and it's probably going to be about 4500 to $5,500 to do a business valuation. 
if you're going to be selling it to key employees or to your children. That's not bad. I mean, you're talking about three years and only, only for me, 20 to 25 hours to do the evaluation. That's not, that's pretty good. Okay. So $4,500 well, we, on average. I got it. Yeah. That's, that, that's kind of, you know, if it's a bigger company and if it's more complicated, it might be 500 or 800 more. Maybe it could, could be higher, but, but it's somewhere in that ballpark. But we need to know what's the value, and then we have to figure out what is your cost basis in the company. That means the value that you've put into it. So let's say the business is worth exactly $1 million, and over the last 30 years, you have built up a basis of 400000 What do you, so you, you, you mean by basis? I, I, I have an idea. That's your cost everybody. basis. Oh. You know, uh, an example would be if you paid – $400 for Apple stock a few years ago, and now it's worth $1,000. So your cost basis in Apple that you paid is 400 If you sell it for $1,000, you have got $600 of capital gains. Okay, $600 of that profit, sense? which is called capital gains. $600 yes. of profit. In there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So now, just add a zero to all that, and if – or three zeros – uh, if your company's worth a million dollars, and over the years you've built up a basis, your cost basis is four hundred thousand, then your capital gains is going to be six hundred thousand. You know, and there's that's real simple, but there's a lot of other things that go into that. But you're going to have some capital gains tax to pay, so you need to know how much you're going to have left after the sale, after you pay taxes, and then we need to know what's the cash flow. In the accounting industry, they call it uh, E-B-I-T-D-A, earnings before taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And so that EBITDA, or uh, E-B-I-T-D-A, is the amount of cash flow that the buyer is going to have to work with. So let's just make up a number. Let's say your business is worth a million dollars, your gross sales is $2 million, and your cash flow, or EBITDA, is uh, 200000 so if the employees are going to buy you out, they've got cash flow of 200000 to work with. They don't have $2 million because by the time they pay the rent and they pay the payroll and they pay all the bills, there's 200000 left. So that's what they have to work with to pay off a, a bank loan or a promissory note to you. So I need to know what's that cash flow. We've we got to figure that out. Is it 100000 or two hundred, or what is the number? Because a banker it needs to know that. Or if you're going to take back a promissory note and the employees are going to buy it from you and they're going to send you a check every month, you need to know that they've got enough cash flow to pay you off. So we need to know what all the cash flow is. It's like going to a bank and borrowing money. You know, They won't loan you any money unless they think you've got enough income to pay for it. So we need a valuation, and then we need to figure out how we're going to sell the stock. Is it going to be in one lump sum, or is it going to be over three or four years? You know, so every company's a little different. Every family's a little different. Uh, so those are some of the steps. We've got to figure out what it's worth. And then uh, it, it, one of the things that a lot of people do with their key employees is they'll sell them about 15 to 20 percent over three or four years, and the employees will sign a promissory note, and they'll pay for it out of their income and out of their bonuses. Uh, so at the end of three or four years, they own 15 or 20 percent of the company. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that time period, whether it be three years, five, four years, five years, part of the plan, it's all written out ahead of time, that they would go to the bank and get an SBA loan to buy the other 80 percent. So you sold your key employees 20 percent. And then maybe at the end of the fourth or fifth year, they create a worker cooperative, and the worker cooperative with all the employees involved would borrow the other 80% and pay you off. So you'd get a check, then you'd pay capital gains tax, and then the worker cooperative would make payments to the um, bank for the SBA loan. You know, So what's it worth developing a timeline on how to sell it? Is there enough cash flow? You know, and how to make it work. So those are all the things we have to go through. And if we're selling, if if we're selling to children, it's a little different, uh, but it's still all the same steps. You know, what's it worth? What's the real cash flow? What's the real EBITDA that I've got to work with? And can they afford to buy it 
uh, at the valuation price. So earnings before interest and taxes yeah. and taxes, depreciation, depreciation and, amortization. and amortization. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh. E-B-I-T-D-A. So that tells me how much cash there really is to work with. And it, it's always more than what the tax return says. You know, Your tax return might say that you made $25,000 last year. But by the time I add back depreciation and interest that you've paid a bank, now maybe it's up to eighty or ninety thousand. And then when I add back the employee benefits, like your health insurance premiums, because when you're gone, that cash is available to the buyers, the worker cooperative, or the employee, or the children. So I can add back your health insurance. I add back the company pays for maybe some of your travel expense. The company pays for your maybe your cell phone. So when I add back all those items, the cash flow gets higher and higher. So the EBITDA is maybe uh, 100 to 200,000. It's not that 25,000 that was on the tax return. Under the current tax system, you can write off a lot of things. You can depreciate and take tax deductions. So that's why we have to tear apart every tax return and understand where all the money's coming from. Okay. So you get this picture, the numbers tell you a picture. Uh, right. Being a math major, I, I could get pictures out of numbers better, better than I could words. <clears throat> so you, you get this picture laid out, and it tells, okay, here's the amount of cash that's available for the whoever's buying it, children, employees, somebody outside, mm-hmm. uh, somebody in the industry or whomever is buying it. How much cash is available to pay for the business? That's what you're looking for. That's it. That's the EBITDA number. Uh, that we're looking for. Uh, you know, when I add back all the benefits that the owner was taking, I add back, you know, maybe some of the owner's salary, maybe some of the owner's bonuses. I can't add it all back, but Cause somebody's you know, got to do that job. Yeah. Somebody's <laughs> got to do that job. Yeah. And so I can add back some of it. And, and so that's why we have to understand what's going on in the company. So we figure out what's that picture look like, how much cash flow, what can we afford? You know, can the employees do it? And then we have to find a bank, you know, and you're one of your sponsors. The NCB, National Co-op Bank, is excellent at working with co-ops all over the country and making SBA loans to a lot of the groups that we work with. You know, there's several good banks across the country, and NCB is one of them that does a lot of uh, SBA loans. Yeah, it was at one point SBA would not do loans to co-ops. I had to get that law changed. Yep, and... And I'm glad they did because it, it, it's a it's a giant it's a giant piece of business because I don't know exactly how many members there are, but <clears throat> there's probably just in the hardware industry there's probably um, twenty to twenty five thousand members that belong to purchasing co-ops, you know, and in, in the food industry, the grocery stores across the country that are belong to co-ops, there's probably another fifty to a hundred thousand members, and and the you know, every other industry, the heating and air conditioning, the floor covering, the industrial tools, uh, every group that you can think of, there's hundreds of thousands of business owners, and they're all potential borrowers to go to banks and get SBA loans. So it's it's a huge, huge number of potential customers. And when you're talking to members, I want to make sure I got clarity. When you're talking about members like at a food store, you're talking about the the food company. Yeah, I'm talking about like uh, you know the like the IGA stores. Uh, they the uh, each store is owned by a separate family, but but they belong to a big buying group. Uh, okay. The ag the ag industry and the food industry has a lot of co-ops, and lots of other industries have co-ops. So you add them all up, there's a lot of family businesses. Um, you know, there's about uh, there's about 30 million family businesses in the United States. Uh, they're not all members of co-ops, but but uh, there's hundreds of thousands of co-op members, and every one of them is a family business that owns a company, and uh, they're all put good potential borrowers for uh, NCB and the other banks that work with the co-ops across the country. You know, and like the housing co-ops that you talked about, they all need to be able to borrow money. Absolutely, both mm-hmm. when they get started, uh, starting a, a housing co-op, but also – after they've been around for 30, 40 years, they've got to get renovated or a new roof or new pavement for the parking lot or new hallways. So they need All money. of that. Yeah. 
And too often, yeah. unfortunately, um, too many housing co-ops have not saved the money. They call it replacement reserve, but they haven't saved enough to take care of all of that, those things. So they've got to go borrow some money. Some do have enough savings, but too often they don't. Yeah. I know several that uh, haven't accumulated enough. Uh, they, instead of saving it, they used it to fix the hallway or to fix plumbing. So when it come time to, uh, you know, need the cash, it wasn't there. Yeah. But the other thing I've found out in a housing co-op where the members are the people that live in it, the consumers that live in there, they have to be able to vote to have an increase in their rent. <laughs> and that's sometimes hard to do, I mean, for all of us to say, look, I'm I'm paying $800 a month now rent. I want to raise it to $850 a month. A lot of members don't want to do that. And that's, therefore, it's hard to get that savings going. Um, yep. that, that is one of the problems. That happens all the time. Yeah, Gary, it, it, this happens all the time, too, is that we're going to go into our last break. This hour goes by very quickly. And so I want to come back and get you to talk about some examples of, of these, some more examples of particular. How, it may take one of them of going through it and showing what you ended up doing to create. Or if you got a worker cooperative, that would be great. But if you don't, maybe some other example. But we'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative, and National Cooperative Bank sponsors this program. You know, NCB's mission is to help co-ops in the U.S., all types of co-ops. And our guest today, Mr. Gary Pittsford, has already talked about how it helps NCB help uh, different companies, whether it's a worker cooperative, a housing cooperative. It doesn't make any difference. They help them. But they also, when Congress created NCB in, in the early 80s, its mission was to help those communities that were economically challenged. And that gets hard for a bank. And NCB does a good job of that, going into communities that are economically challenged and helping them. So they end up helping not only businesses and individuals, but communities. Gary, one of the things that that happens in a worker cooperative, whether the food co-op or uh, uh, in cooperative, food or work cooperative, whatever, is that people live in the community. And therefore, that money stays in that community. And I didn't understand this when I took economics. So that money ended up turning in that community seven, eight times. And it helps to the, the community to develop and to grow and to flourish. So NCB does a great job for communities around the U.S. What I wanted to talk to you about, well, first, you have three companies. And tell us how you end up forming those three companies to to help this process that you talked about of getting people to sell or their company and going into retirement. Uh, well, very quickly, the over the years, over the last 45 years, we started out with just a planning company that helped do all the – helped create the blueprint on how do I sell my company to my children or how do I sell it to my employees or how do I sell it to somebody. So we did a lot of planning for the first few years. And then and then I got to the point where we had to have a proper valuation in order to finish the planning, in order to do the transition. And common term nowadays is called succession or exit planning. Uh, so I created a valuation company because we knew more about the industries that we specialized in than a typical valuation company or a typical accounting firm <clears throat> that only works with two or three members. We may work with several hundred members. And then a few years later, people would say, well, I sold my company. I need help managing these assets for retirement. So a few years later, I created uh, another company, uh, Castle Investment Advisors, that manages – it's a registered – uh, with the SEC, and it's an investment management firm that helps people manage these retirement assets and family assets and add trusts for children and foundations that families set up. So it just, just developed over the years that uh, people were asking for all these different services. So we, I created a company to fill that need, you know. But you know, all the companies added together basically work as a family office is the common term nowadays that 
helps families with all of these uh, outside financial decisions. You know, should I should I be an S corp or should I be a C corp or should I be a limited liability company? You know, should I have a buy sell agreement? You know, uh, what kind of a trust agreement should I have to protect my wife and my children and my grandchildren and my charities? You know, what kind of documents do I need? You know, what's a triple net lease? You know, I own the business and I also own the real estate. I want to sell the business, but I want to keep the real estate. How do I do all that? You know, so I've set up these companies to answer all those questions, and <clears throat> all the people that work here with us uh, do a great job of helping people with all of these financial questions. Uh, this whole process of succession and exit planning and transitioning to the next owner, if it's done right, it will increase the value of your sale. It will minimize the taxes. It will protect the employees and protect the community. So if business owners, if they get this knowledge that you're talking about, and then they spend two or three years putting this plan together, this big blueprint, we got to make sure that all the lines touch. I always talk about a lot of people I meet, they think they got a blueprint, and I keep telling them, you got a blueprint, but the lines don't touch. You know, so you, you got to get all the lines to come together. It's all got to work together. And if you do it right over two or three years, you'll have a higher sale. You'll have probably less taxes. You'll have a plan that protects everybody. You're doing what you want to do. And it's a great way to exit the company by preparing all of this blueprint or this plan ahead of time. So all the stuff that you're talking about is important, but they need to go home and implement it. And they need to develop uh, a team of advisors. You know, you've got a team of employees that helps you run the company, runs every department, you know, the, in, in your company. But now that you're getting ready to sell the company, you need a different team. You need a really sharp accountant. You need a really sharp attorney that does business work. You need a really sharp financial person that can help you with all the money decisions. So you need to develop a team, talk to that team over two or three years develop this blueprint. You can't do it in a week or two. It's going to take months to put it all together properly. But have that team of advisors put it together, and then everything will work out better. Trying to do it by yourself never works. Well, here's here's what I'm hearing you say. I, I want to break it down in terms that I can understand. If you if you do this two- to three-year planning with the, with the intent of implementing it, you get more money. <laughs> and by paying less taxes, you keep more money, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and then you help everybody. You help your family members. You help the employees. You help the community. You just everybody is better off by doing this planning. And and the individual that's selling is better off because they have more money that they keep. And with investing it and getting somebody to help them and invest it with, with Castle uh, Investment Advisors, you end up being able to, to to have make good decisions on what you use that money for so you'll have monthly money coming in for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however long you're there. Did that summarize yeah. that? More money. Yeah, you're very good. You, you, you summed it up pretty well. If you do this planning ahead of time and if you put together all the right pieces on what kind of company you should have, you know, how to sell it, what's it worth, Spend two or three years probably increasing the profitability a little bit. Get it ready. You know, Business owners try very hard for the last 30 or 40 years to make their tax returns look real bad. And I keep telling them, I said, now what I need you to do the next three or four years, I need you to figure out where all that money's at. And I, I, you need to tell me the whole story and give me all the good news. He goes, based on your tax returns, your company's not worth much. You know, so now I need to change the picture, you know, and everybody kind of laughs, but that's what you have to do. <clears throat> it's like selling your house. You know, you're going to paint the outside. You're going to put in new carpeting. You're going to fix it up. You know, if you're going to sell your car, you're going to go and have it cleaned. You're going to have it swept out, you know. So if you're going to sell your company, you got to do the same thing. You got to paint it and clean it and sweep it out and get it, make it look good and spend two or three years making those tax returns look good. Remember I said I need to look at the last three years' tax returns and the last three years' financials. So yeah. so I need all the good information, you know, and if, and if it's all bad, then, you know, we can't sell it for much, you know. But if we can make it good, if you can show me where where everything's at, 
that's what we have to look for. That's what we got to find. So the last three or four years have to look good. Okay. All right. You just told me I have some work to do. That's what you just told me. I, I'm taking this very <laughs> personal. Yeah. I have two or three years of work. Okay. Laid out for me. Well, I can help somebody sell a company in 30 days or six months or 12 months, but we won't be able to get the best price and I won't be able to save taxes if you make me do it fast. Okay. Some people say, I want to retire in three months. Okay. We can do that, but you're not going to get the best price and you're probably going to pay a little bit higher taxes, you know, but we can make it happen. But planning ahead and preparing is always a good idea. But the business owners, the co-op members, they just don't know how to plan. And that's why we go to so many conventions. I think I go to 24 or 25 conventions a year. And we talk about here's what we got to do the next three or four years in order to make this company look great in order to get it ready for sale. We got to get the EBITDA up. We got to get the cash flow up. We got to make it look good and then we can sell it. And making it look good, I I do take this is you don't do it with mirrors. It, the numbers are real, real. No, the numbers are real. Yeah. You know, but okay. I got to know, I, I got to know where everything's at. You know, I got to know what all the write-offs are. What's all the depreciation? Uh, I, I got to add back all of these numbers. Based on our tax law, you can write off a lot of items, deduct them off your tax return. But the buyer, when the buyer gets ready to buy the company or the banker looks at those tax returns and, and they get ready to make a big loan, they got to see where's the real cash flow? Where's it all at? Bring, Add back all the write-offs, all the depreciation, all the interest payments. So we got to take that tax return and tear it apart and make it look good. Okay. And I just want to make sure that, and I, and I I knew that you were saying this, making it look good is the numbers are real, real. It's not, they're all truthful, but it's in a format where the banks banks and potential buyers can see, here's what the real cash flow is. This is what's yeah. at the bottom of the line. And you can decide what you're going to write off and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yep. Yep. You've got, we, we have to spend some time uh, painting the picture and getting what the real numbers are. And, and hopefully... Real- Hopefully they've got good profits. Yeah, Gary, last minute, what do you want to leave people with? Get more education. Understand the process of getting ready to sell a company. Understand succession planning. Figure out what's the next step and then go to work. You know, I, I've written several articles about you got to work on the business, not in the business part of the time. So Take, uh, you know, every quarter, take one or two hours and work on the company, not in the company. You know, All right, do something sir. good. We're, we're, we're going to, I thank you very much, Gary, for taking out time to talk with us today. Everybody out there, please have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Thursday and live cooperatively. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, and 95.9 FM.